Jesus had some very strong, uh, decisive things to say about marriage and divorce. Uh, I'm told, and I don't know if these statistics are correct, that the divorce rate in and out of the evangelical church in Georgia, where we live, seems to be almost on a par. That suggests that the system, what they call evangelicalism, doesn't work that well. Perhaps they should close the shop, go home and restudy the Bible and do a different system. A bit like, one might say, trying to play golf with a tennis racket or play golf with a racket or the, with a golf club upside down would be confusing. You're not going to get results just by adjusting your feet or your eyes or your fingers. It may be that systematically there's something that isn't quite right with evangelicalism. That's a suggestion. There in the 19th chapter of Matthew, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee, and some of the Pharisees came to test Jesus. You know, they were always critics of Jesus to see if he was sound, if he was real, if he was genuine. And they asked him the, uh, the question about, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause, for any and every cause? As everybody knows, there was a strict school of Shammai, Rabbi Shammai, and a much more liberal school of Hillel. Hillel, you could have a divorce for practically anything, burning the toast, I say humorously. Shammai, more only if sexual, commit, uh, sexual uh, uh, sins uh, Shammai, only if some sexual deviation had occurred in the marriage, unrepentant and so on. So Jesus is asked to take a stand as between those two schools. So he begins by saying to them, haven't you read what he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? He goes back to Genesis. This is most significant because in Deuteronomy 24, a right to divorce had been conceded permitted, not commanded, but permitted by Moses, because of the hardness of their hearts now. It was not God's ideal. It was almost, you might say, a way of regulating adultery in view of the fact that women were being divorced unfairly. And so you had to give a certificate for whatever that reason was. It's not entirely clear. But Jesus disregards that concession of Moses and goes back behind it to an ideal in Genesis and establishes marriage then as an insoluble union, allowing only one uh, exception, unless it were for fornication, which presumably in that setting would mean sexual sin. And of course, that's not a requirement for a divorce. It can be forgiven. Reconciliation can take place even despite sexual sin. But ongoing unrepentant sexual sin would mean that the one committing that sin against the marriage would be really counted as an unbeliever. That's Jesus' simple, straightforward answer. You cannot have a divorce for anything you'd like to imagine. God ideally wants marriages to stay together. God hates divorce, as we read in Malachi. My goodness, what a marvelous idea. Look at the trouble. Look at the agony the suffering, the misery caused to children of broken marriages. Look at the chaos when we don't stick with this very fundamental uh, point that Jesus makes here. Now, over in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul deals with the same subject. It's not a complex subject, may I say. In two verses, Paul deals with believers, and I want to concentrate on that for a moment. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. That's chapter 7, verses 10 to 11. He addresses believers, not a mixed marriage of a believer and a non-believer, but a believing Christian marriage. Now, of course, for Paul, a Christian may have looked a little different from what it is now. That's another question. But for Paul, a true believer, married to a true believer, has these options. He says that they should stick together. He says that if they should separate, he or she, I'm taking it in both directions, should alas separate, they should remain on their own, single, or else get reconciled. You can see the same Jesus ideal there. That marriage should not be broken. If alas and alack, a separation should have been caused for whatever reason, 
And there's absolutely no justification here for imagining a Roman rule, a Roman law, which says that if you separate your automatic divorce, that could have been in Paul's mind, but he doesn't say that. Nowhere does Jesus or Paul have to reckon with Roman law. But if a separation has occurred, then the offending party, the one who is separated, might not even be the offending party. For some reason, there's a separation. Then the rule is stay unmarried to someone else or else get back with your original partner. That's extremely clear. What has happened in some quarters today is that the term unmarried there has been twisted to mean divorced, thus turning Paul's whole statement on its head. In fact, it's not Paul, it's Jesus, as Paul says, Jesus speaking here in 1 Corinthians 7. You are to remain unmarried. Now, one can cleverly equivocate on the word unmarried there. In this passage, it clearly means remain unmarried to someone else or get reconciled. Do not marry someone else. And then Paul reinforces that, Jesus reinforces it at the end of that passage by saying, let the man, in this case, not divorce his wife. This is exactly what Jesus was saying in Matthew 19. It would be totally false to say that Paul is sanctioning under Roman law an automatic divorce by separation. That would turn Paul's statement on its head. It's wrong. Paul didn't say that the person would be called unmarried and therefore divorced. He said he or she is to remain unmarried, not remain divorced. That would be nonsensical. So I want to warn you against that false teaching that is in some quarters being promoted. I might say that what I'm suggesting here is found in all commentary, I think almost without exception. I could only quote F.F. F. Bruce, who was generous and kind enough to correspond with me many years ago in the 80s. But F.F. F. Bruce in the New International Commentary on 1 Corinthians says this, let the woman who separates, if she should be in that condition, let her remain unmarried, i.e. to someone else to offset any possible confusion there. That's plainly the meaning. It's a very great error to challenge all commentary for 2,000 years in every language. Plain common sense is the meaning of that requirement that a separated person should not get married to someone else. Now, one could add this, that if that separated person were to remain deliberately separated ongoing forever, so to speak, without any chance or opportunity or willingness to be reconciled, then that person would be designated an unbeliever. And there then, the rules are different. Paul goes on to describe the situation where you have a mixed marriage and an unbeliever may decide to leave. At which case, in which case, the believer is not forced to chase that mate round the Roman, British Empire, or whatever, to keep the marriage together. At that point, apparently then, a divorce with the right to remarriage. I take the view of evangelicalism mainly. In all probability, that marriage is not bound anymore. But as long as the two are believers, they are supposed to get together and not break that marriage up. Now, some say, well, there's the issue of conjugal rights in marriage, that you would have a right to divorce for abuse in the sensitive area of conjugal rights. Paul deals with that earlier on. He speaks of the mutuality of the sexual element in marriage among believers. He assumes that those believers are going to be hearing Paul and Jesus' words there and are going to be responding properly. So there's no question here. Nobody's saying that Paul is saying that a failure to measure up to those conjugal rights gives you an automatic right to divorce. That would be absurd. I mean, how much abuse is abuse? You can imagine how vague and over-liberal would become the right to divorce if you talk vaguely about failure to meet conjugal rights. That's something to be worked out. Paul also said if a man won't work to support his family, he's denied the faith. That's clear. He's become an unbeliever. So amongst believers, these things these sensitive areas of conjugal rights within marriage are to be worked out. They are not grounds for divorce.